What is misery? I want to talk about the misery of the cross, but what is misery? Well, it's all kinds of things. It's pain. It's a thing called agony, anguish, despair, discomfort, gloom, grief, hardship. It's a headache that won't go away. It's a heartache that will not be removed. It's passion. It's sadness. It's sorrow. It's squalor. It's suffering. It's torment. It's torture. It's woe. It's worry. It's any ache. It's the blues. It's the depression that you have that just seems to not go away. It's the feeling of des desolation and despondency, of distress and dollar. It's hurting. It's melancholy that will not subside. It's pain. It's a stitch you have. It's a throw. It's a whinge in your body. It's unhappiness. It's worriment. It's wretchedness. Or it's just bad news. There's a lot of misery in the world, is there not? Now, we may deal with our misery many ways. We may deal with our misery by just denying that we're miserable. You know, people do that. I don't know if you remember the Soviet Union, but uh, it wasn't too long ago we were worried about that place. Ex-prisoner executed by a firing squad on September the 5th, 1937. His name was Andrei Stefanovich uh, Azerlovsky. I think Kurt would be proud of that. <laughs> he said this, I love this quote. There was a fight in a line at the factory. People were hurt and a couple of policemen showed up. People just can't seem to appreciate how happy their lives are. And then he was executed, so. We just deny that we're miserable. Peter, or Petra Cholub, who's also from Russia. And I was thinking about putting the picture of Stalin up, but I really didn't want to honor Stalin. Yeah, you know, he's responsible for about 20 million deaths. It's kind of hard to honor him, but he, wrote, he did posters in the 1930s. He died in 1953, and he did a poster of Stalin looking at his naval fleet. And it is very likely the reason he died in 1953 is that he was put in prison and probably executed because he made a poster of Stalin, and it's the famous poster of the three-fingered Stalin. Literally, he drew him with only three fingers on one hand and three fingers on the other. You'd have to see it. How does a drawer make that kind of mistake unless it's intentional? So, If there's negative things to be said, we just deny that they exist. That's the way the Soviet Union dealt with a lot. In fact, even now, North Korea deals with things much that way. A physician named Norbert Wollerstein, who is a German, uh, he was part of a German medical team that went to North Korea in 2001. He became famous and was allowed to travel North Korea because he is along with other teams there in Pyongyang. Uh, he was part of the group that literally a man was burned so badly they had no method to take care of him. There was no uh, skin graft ability and so all the doctors literally took pieces of their own skin and grafted it onto the man to save his life. Because of that, he got this award and they gave him a key to a car. He could travel wherever he wanted, be anywhere in North Korea that he wanted. But then he said, and he's written since he left North Korea, I learned after a while that North Korea was two countries, Pyongyang for the elite and the countryside for the poor. Pyongyang was a modern city, had hotels, CNN, shops were filled with food, but the countryside was a different thing. People in Pyongyang have no idea that most of their country is starving. They did not believe me when I told them. I showed photos of Seoul and of New York City, and the North Koreans in the countryside said I was lying, and they were fake pictures. There is no running water, no food, no electricity, no heat, no medicine, no soap. They live in terror, they use their children to build roads, and they try to flee from time to time to China, especially the Christians. If they are caught, they are put into a concentration camp and tortured. That's denying you're miserable. People do that. People even who go to church sometimes are miserable 
and they just deny that they are. Now we may deal with our misery by denying it or we may deal with it in other ways. Sometimes we try to make other people miserable and that makes us feel better. I like this one. Uh, did you fall from heaven? Doesn't that sound so sweet? Did you fall from heaven? Because your face looks like you hit real hard. <laughs> people try to make you feel more miserable because they're unhappy. If I promise to miss you, will you go like really far away? So people can be very ugly. And a study from December 2009 issued from the Journal of Pain said that they studied 160 couples where one partner had a chronic disease or sickness and they were in pain all the time and they discovered that the person who was sick felt more support from their partner if they complained more about their problem. So they excessively exaggerated their perception of pain and its disabilities so that they would get more sympathy. So basically they made their partner more miserable so that they could deal with it better it's called catastrophizing. It's actually got a name. People actually do that. Caregivers experience caregiver burnout partly because of that, where they go through a withdrawal, lost interest, irritability, depression, loss of appetite, weight gain. I don't know, that sounds kind of like most of everybody's life, but th that's what they go through when they have to deal with this constant complaining of troubles that maybe aren't as severe, but they like to do that to the people around them because if you make the other people miserable, maybe you can deal with your own misery a little better. So people deal with it that way. So they make other people miserable, they deny that they're miserable. There's another thing that we do is sometimes we get solace in just recognizing that maybe other people are more miserable than us. Uh, we may tell ourselves that, well, there are many folks in the world got it worse off than you. And you say, wait a second, I, I've never, yeah, you have. You might have done this one. Most of us probably have. You've heard this, misery loves company. Unhappy people like other people to be unhappy too. Few sufferers make unhappiness easier to bear. Excuse me, fellow, not few. <laughs> in, in an odd way, we deal with our misery by doing this, and this is very old. It goes back to a guy named Sophocles back in 406 who wrote plays, and he actually has in one of his plays this thing about misery loves company. So it's an old concept. That's 406 BC. Uh, does it make you feel better to know that 88% of the world right now experiences pain in their muscles, tendons, ligaments, and joints, and that 65% of the world is in pain every day? Does that make you feel any better? The Gulistan, or the Rose Garden, is a famous proverb from Persia from 1258, and famous, you probably haven't heard of it. It says, I've never complained of the vicissitudes of fortune, nor suffered my face to be overcast at the revolution of the heavens, except once when my feet were bare, and I had not the means of obtaining shoes. I came to the chief of Kufa in a state of much dejection, and saw there is a man who had no feet. I returned thanks to God and acknowledged His mercies and endured my want of shoes with patience. Helen Keller shortened that. She said, and you know she was blind, right? She said, I cried because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. Red Foley actually made this very popular. He was a country music guy back right after World War II. Some of you may remember him, a singer, musician. He wrote, forgive me when I whine. You've probably heard this before. It says, today upon a bus, I saw a lovely maid with golden hair. I envied her, she seemed so gay. And oh, I wished I were so fair. When suddenly she rose to leave, I saw her hobble down the aisle. She had one foot and wore a crutch. But as she passed, a smile. Oh God, forgive me when I whine. I have two feet. The world is mine. And when I stopped to buy some sweets, the lad who served me had such charm. He seemed to radiate good cheer. His manner was so kind and warm. I said, it's nice to deal with you. Such courtesy I seldom find. He turned and said, oh, thank you, sir. And I saw that he was blind. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine. I have two eyes. The world is mine. 
Then when walking down the street, I saw a child with eyes of blue. He stood and watched the others play. It seemed he knew not what to do. I stopped a moment. Then I said, why, do you join, why don't you join the others, dear? He looked ahead without a word. And then I knew he could not hear. Oh God, forgive me when I whine. I have two ears, the world is mine. With feet to take me where I'd go, with eyes to see the sunset glow, with ears to hear what I should know. I'm blessed indeed, the world is mine. Oh God, forgive me when I whine. So one of the ways that we feel better about our misery is we look and see other people we think is worse off. But there's another way, the better way. The best way to deal with your misery is to learn that it's taken away in Jesus Christ. And Christ removes all misery permanently, forevermore, eventually. In Isaiah 53 it says, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. Hebrews 2 and verse 18 says, In that He Himself has suffered being tempted, He is able to aid those who are tempted. 1 Peter 4 verse 1, Christ suffered for us. 1 Peter 3, 18, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. Revelation 21 verse 4, God will wipe away every tear. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Amen. Let's take a look at the three miseries. I'm not going to be that long. Three miseries that Jesus Christ endured on the cross. Just briefly, and then we'll be done. The first misery, His misery of the abandonment of the cross. I want you to see how He has gone through any misery you have faced, at least in a sense. Have you been abandoned? He endured the betrayal. In Luke twenty two forty eight. 48, it says, So Judas betraying the Son of Man with a kiss. What a way to betray. He endured the fleeing. In Matthew 26, 31, He strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And so they did. They scattered away from Him. They didn't stand with Him at the trial. They were not standing up for Him. The very ones that He loved and had been so faithful to Him for three and a half years, best buds, and they all just ran. He endured the denying. You know, it's one thing for your friend to leave you. It's another thing that when he's cornered, when he tries to slip up and see what's going on, that he denies you once. Somebody else asks a question, he denies you twice. And then the third time he denies and even puts a curse upon himself if he's not telling the truth. And then Jesus, it says, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Yeah. How would you like that to happen to you? Someone doesn't even want to recognize you even exist. Then he endured the condemning. Now it's interesting, crowds came out to hear Jesus, multitudes of men and women. Even around the temple the last week of his life, multitudes gathered to hear Jesus in the temple courts. But it, those same people, just a little later, one or two days, Matthew 26, 22 through 25, were shouting, let him be crucified, let him be crucified, so much so that a riot was about to develop. These are the people that said, Oh, what words. Kill him. He endured that. He endured the gambling. In Mark 15, verse 24, they crucified him and then they divided his garments and cast lots for his things. Now when all you've got left is the clothes on your back and they strip you of that and then they, right in front of you, gamble for it. So have you ever been abandoned? You feel like, oh, you were, maybe you were an orphan child. Maybe you've, your mates turned away from you. Maybe someone said something ugly to you. Maybe they even said it at church. And God doesn't understand. 
Really? God doesn't understand what it's like to be abandoned. He doesn't understand what it's like for people to say bad things about you. He doesn't know what it's like for everybody to turn their back and walk away from you. I believe he knows exactly where you live. He's got your address. He knows for he endured the misery of the abandonment of the cross. Number two, his misery of the anguishment of the cross. This is the actual pain he endured. Oh, but you don't know what kind of pain I've been through. No, I do not. I do not. But I can get a glimpse of what he went through. He endured the beating. In Luke 22, verse 63, it says they beat him, and then it says they struck him in the face. So he got punched a few times. Another text says that they marked him. Marking is taking a pole and driving it into your stomach so that it leaves quite a severe bruise and can rupture your innards. And then he endured the crowning. Now you think, well, they're mocking. Well, I'm not talking about the mocking right now. Matthew 27, verse 29, they twisted a crown of thorns. These are not like off of a rose bush. That's all what grows around there. If you've ever seen a thorn tree, thorns will grow anywhere from there to that long. Okay, and unless you've been saying, I've had a thorn of a thorn tree in me, that ain't funny. Just one. And so they twisted it and shoved it down on his head. He endured the scourging, John 19, verse 1. It's very simple. Isn't it interesting how you can put such an awful thing in just a couple of words? Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And it sounds like, oh, it's just nothing. Have you ever been hit with a whip? Now, you got to understand, there was no limit on this one. You, you could only whip anybody normally 39 stripes if you're Jewish, but this is Romans. They don't have that rule. They could just go on and on. We don't know how many times he was hit. Even if it were only three, that's more than I want to face. But if he is hit 20, 30, 40 times with the three lashes that have things embedded in it, I'm sorry, most of us, could not endure that and even stay awake. And then he endured the carrying. He had to, after all this has happened, he has now got to carry, it's like carrying your own electric chair. He had to carry his own electric chair, the cross. And John 19, 17, bearing his cross, he went up. Now, he did fall apparently and they did get Simon to help him as we read in the text a moment ago. But initially, he carried his own cross out. After all this has happened, and he's been up all night long. And then they get him to the place of the skull and they nail him. John 19, 18. I want to talk more about the nailing in a week or two. We're going to deal with that because we're going to deal with the cross for about the next three weeks, Lord willing. But they crucified him and two others with him. Now you might think, well, at least there's somebody else dying next to you. I'm sorry, I don't think that gives you any solace when you've just been nailed to a piece of wood. So he knows. You say, well... Nobody knows my pain. He does, God doesn't know how I feel. It's like he's abandoned me here. Listen to me, my friend. He knows what it is to hurt. He knows, for he endured the misery of the anguishment of pain itself at the highest level. Then number three. His misery of the abasement of the cross. And you, you think, well, what else is there? Abandonment, pain. This one may be the worst thing. This may actually be the worst thing that can happen to somebody. You may think it's pain. But I don't know. Maybe you think it's abandonment. I don't know about that one. But to be absolutely humiliated by everybody. Have you ever had anybody humiliate you? I mean really humiliate you. One or two well, first he endured the Sanhedrin's humiliation of mocking him. In Matthew 26, 63 through 68, it goes into detail. The high priest at one point tears his clothes, something he wasn't supposed to ever do. He tears his clothes after he, he finally adjures him to get to kind of admit he's the son of God. And he says, what further need? He's blasphemed. He's blasphemed. All of us should vote that he be killed. And yet, when you suggest that the Son of God blasphemed for saying He's the Son of God. You know it, but they can't accept it. And then 
the soldiers mock him. In Luke 18, verse 32, it says that Jesus had predicted, he said the Gentiles, referring to the Romans, the Gentiles or the Romans will mock, they will insult, and they will spit upon the Son of God. Now, you gotta understand, if you're a Jew, I mean, you don't even wanna deal with these people. They're unclean people, they don't live right. They don't even do things halfway right. This is the Romans. And yet, these are the people that are gonna mock the Son of God they're going to insult the Son of God, and then they're going to <laughs> on the Son of God. Then he endured the governor's mocking. And the governor was rather docile here, but it's quite interesting. He simply, he's making a joke. This is a joke to him. Pilate wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. He's killing him. He's sending a message to the Jews. There ain't nobody here that's going to be our king. There's one king, that's Caesar. He's making fun of them as well as him, mocking them as he goes. Then the passers by. So he's hanging on the cross. He's dying. He's suffering. He's going through all the things we've already talked about. And there he hangs and just passers by. People, we don't even know who they were. They're not necessarily connected to any of this. They're just walking down the street. So apparently, this is right next to the street. Walking down the street, they see him hanging on the cross. And listen, they actually have heard of this Jesus. And it says that they blasphemed him. And they did this. Yeah. You saved others. You can't save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Then we'll believe. Some of them came by, yeah, you are going to destroy the temple and build it again in three days, yeah. Have you ever had anybody wag their head at you while they're insulting you? Then the thieves mocking. The thieves, the guy's dying next to you. Yeah, I know about the one thief, thinks it over later, but it's very clear that it wasn't the singular thief, it was the plural thieves at first. Even the robbers crucified with him reviled him. Now I don't know what they said, but they made fun of him at first. Wow, you're dying right next to me and you know you're fixing to face the Lord and yet you're willing to embarrass me. So he knows. So whatever you've been through, you say, well nobody knows what it's like to be hurt. I was made fun of as a kid. People made fun of me. They said, oh, fatty, or oh, you're so slow. You're the last one we're going to put on the team. Whatever you think you've endured. My mom always liked my sister best. So you've been embarrassed, and you've been hurt, and he doesn't know. Oh, my friend, he knows, for he endured the misery of the abasement of the cross. Well, that's the simple lesson today. It's about all I have for you except to say that he knows for he endured the same kind of pain and misery that we endured. In Hebrews 4, 15 it says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize. He knows how you feel. You may feel like he doesn't, but in all points like we face, he faced similarly. I read this story. Did it move? Did it move? Yeah, it did. A young girl married and went to live with her husband. This was many years ago. Went to live with her husband's family far away, which was pretty common back in that day. She missed her family, though. You couldn't travel back then. And by the new family, she felt unwanted. Some of you women know what that's like to move in among somebody else's family. She did everything wrong, she felt. So she's very unhappy. But then her son was born and everything got better. Baby makes everything better. But then her husband got sick and he died. So now it's just her and the baby in this strange land with a strange family. And then her baby got ill and her baby died. And she was so stricken with grief that she could not accept it. She just kept saying her baby was sick. So she kept toting around this dead baby. And she kept asking people, do you know where there's some medicine that would make my baby well? She had lost it. 
She asked everyone. Finally, somebody says, well, maybe the miracle worker, the wise guru that lives up in the mountains, maybe he can do something. So she struck out with the baby in her arms, climbed the mountain, finds the shack, knocks on the door. The old guy comes to the door and he sees immediately she's carrying a dead baby. And she starts talking about her sick baby and could he give her something that would make her baby well? He said, yes, I can. Well, what is it? What is it? He said, well, you must go down into the village and get some mustard seed, just a handful, and bring it back to me, and we can make your baby well. But, but, but wait, before you go, she almost rushed off and said, wait, that has to be special mustard seed. It has to be mustard seed from some family down in the village who hasn't experienced grief in their home, that hasn't known the grief of loss. Now, if you can go down there and find mustard seed from that home and bring it back, we can make your child well. And so she was thrilled. Off she went. Goes in the first house. Do you have any mustard seed? Yes, we have some mustard seed. Could I borrow just a handful? Sure you can. She takes it and she's about to leave and she says, oh, by the way, has anybody in this house ever experienced loss or grief? Oh, yes. Last year, my mother died. And we're still not over it. We're grieving every day. She said, oh. And they tell her the whole story. She gives the mustard seed back. I can't take that mustard seed. She goes to the next house, knocks on the door. Do you have any mustard seed here? Yes, we do. Can I borrow just a handful for my sick baby? Could, could you just, sure, we can give you that. So, but, but wait, has anybody in this home actually ever experienced loss and grief? Oh, but we have. We lost my son last year in a terrible accident. And from house to house, she goes to one after the other until she visits virtually every home in the little village. And the message finally came through to her. And in the middle of that, she looked down at her baby and said, I had tried to keep you with me, but I must let you go. And she buried her baby. And then she went to see the wise man and said, I see what you taught me, that we all must grieve and I must learn how to deal with my grief. Every one of us are going to be miserable. If you haven't been, it's coming. And if you've been, it's coming again. And if you are, it'll be relieved for a little while and then it's coming again. But thank the Lord we serve someone who actually knows what that's like and that He has provided not only hope of eternal life, but hope of eternal life without grief, without sorrow, without misery, amen? Isn't it worth it to take the effort to try to make connection with Him so that we might experience that once, but not just for a little while, but forevermore? Amen. What would you do for that? Well, listen, there's nothing you can do for that but accept Christ. That's it. You can't do anything for it. But He does call upon you to believe. So would you believe? He does call upon you to repent. Would you give your life to Him and make Him Lord of your life? Would you announce that you believe He is and confess Him before men? And would you be willing to be baptized? Oh, that's just too much to ask. Then it's salvation by what we do. No, 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 no. It's salvation only for what He does. But you've got to accept that He makes the rules. If you're willing, that's the invitation for us all. I don't want to be miserable forevermore to you. So if you're willing to be happy forevermore, the invitation is yours while we stand and while we sing.